everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, EHSM. Next up is Natalia uh, Lukacevic. Is that close? <laughs> so uh, she's a PhD candidate at uh, LMU Munich. And um, she's been enamored with uh, the hacker maker movement for a while now and uh, is finishing a project to create a patent exception for user-generated innovation, something I think is uh, sorely needed. Her talk is going to be about um, you know, how hackers and all of us can deal with um, a world with patent law. So I'll hand it over to Natalia. Hello? Do you hear me? OK, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and talk about part of my PhD. Um, to, to, and it's really great to know that there is interest in my uh, PhD thesis outside the Max Planck Institute. I came here with a talk about patent flexibilities, patent limitations. These are legal tools that um, curve a bit of free space around the patent. The fact that uh, makers meet patent law, I think is clear for everyone. I focus, focus on the unpleasant encounters where makers uh, face from time to time uh, the danger of patent infringement claim. And that's why I decided to, to research patent flexibilities. I call them patent windows in the big fortress of patent, of patent law. Uh, I think that this description is unfortunately very accurate, description of patent law. What we can see nowadays is the increasing scope of patentable subject matters. You know, you can patent software. You can also patent DNA, everything that is biological, but um, achieved in in vitro way. Very controversial until t uh, today. Um, the other thing what we observe um, is the increasing recognition of patent rights. You hear, you hear in news patent wars, patent wars uh, currently going in the 3D printing field. Um, this is accompanied by, I dare to say, decreasing patent quality, which results in increasing number of uh, trivial patents. Um, yes, uh, I, will, I will try to give you an overview of patent flexibilities and tools that make, oh yes, that make help you in making I refrain from quoting sections, articles, and case law, but if you were interested, please contact me. I will provide you the detailed data. Um, yeah, it works. Okay. So, um, just to sum up, in my research, I want to answer the following question. Questions, how much freedom to operate is given in the patent law? How much can you make with a patented device? And how can you defend yourself when being sued for making too much with a patented uh, thing? Uh, for the purpose of my study, I adopted um, a model of making. It's very simple. I based it on my readings and observation uh, done on user innovation, do-it-yourself culture, and the maker movement. Uh, just a brief description. Uh, I focus on innovation, innovating process initiated and carried out by individuals, makers, which begins in a closed private sphere, for instance, in a garage or in a basement. At some point, the idea leaks into the public sphere, either via posting in the internet or sharing with friends and hobbies. I was glad to attend yesterday the workshop with Mitch, who presented his story, and it was exactly my, my model, so I was really happy to hear this. Um, anyways, when um, the information, the idea is in the public sphere, I called it collective making, because um, collectively, either with community members or with friends, other hobbies, makers experiment, test, prototype, and continue developing their idea, at some point, it's ready to be put on the market. And like in the Mitch case, if I may to quote, at, you, uh, makers get valuable feedback on commercialization opportunities. And when the product is ready, they simply put it on the market. And commercialization is very dangerous. Well, the troubles begin already with the open sharing because patent law is not that generous to allow public use of patented devices. So. 
keeping in mind this model, I carried a comparative analysis of, for, of flexibility patent exceptions available in four patent system, German, um, the U uh, American, Engl British, and Japanese. I chosen these four countries because they have the greatest impact in the patent system. Um, I divided um, available patent limitations into two categories. Uh, this is required in the legal science statutory limitations, so the ones that are codified. And here I based on the UPC agreement. This is agreement uh, on the unified patent court for the European Union. As you may have heard, European Union have been striving for creating, establishing a unified patent for the whole of for all the EU members for the last 50 years. Last year in February, policymakers um, reached an agreement, and there you can find an exhaustive catalog of exceptions that are available in the whole, so far in each uh, European system. Um, um, and then I also uh, chose, uh, I've chosen four um, legal doctrines. I will present you in a moment. And staying now by, uh, by statutory limitations, as you can see, the catalog is really long, but the sensation of abundance is uh, wrong because not all of them apply to the model of, make, of making. I've chosen four that I found the most suitable. However, they do not apply in 100%. I will explain you them more, more in details. But now I'd like to focus on the one I excluded so that you know what was left, actually what is also available uh, in the patent law. So the first one, permissible uses of biological materials, this point covers two exceptions. The first one is called Bolar exception after the US case, and it allows testing patented substances for the purpose of uh, regulatory approval. It's applicable in the, f in the field of pharmaceuticals, and it's mainly used by companies um, developing generic drugs. The other one, the other exceptions uh, under this point, covers discovering and developing of biological materials. In Germany, um, there is a special uh, separate law for this called plant variety law, and this, this is also in other countries. Then the next one, preparation of a medicine, it covers a situation of preparation of a single medicine for a single patient, and it serves the freedom of treatment. Mm. The third one um, covers situations when you have to repair a patented device to continue safely the journey. Mm. Agricultural purposes, if you have a farm, you can, uh, you can make a use of, of uh, patented substances and devices for the purpose of breeding livestock of multiplica or multiplication of harvest, but not for commercial uses. Uh, then computer programs, I was pretty surprised seeing this exception in the catalog of, pat of patent exceptions because currently computer programs are regulated in copyright law, and this exception covers only the uses um, of um, patented software for the purpose of interoper interoperability. I will not get details into this subject, but if you had questions, then please ask me after the presentation. And uh, the last one covers um, the term. The term is called the exhaustion principle. I will get, it, uh, I will get back to it in a few minutes. Um, it's the exhaustion principle of biological materials. And to explain you on a, an example, if you want to pre, uh, produce beer and you buy yeast and you have to multi, multi, uh, multiply them in order to produce the beer, this is the second generation and you have the exhaustion, well, the, there is the exhaustion rule applying for the second generation and you can make use of this, but you cannot resell those, um, those yeast. I can imagine it's pretty abstract, but I just want to get quickly through these exceptions I excluded. And now, uh, non-statutory limitations. These are patent doctrines. I've chosen only four. The first one, repair doctrine. I think everyone intuitively understands what it's about. It's about restoring normal utility of patented device. And the three others, they concern the issue of equivalency. So it's about similarity 
between a patented device and the, the infringing one. I'll explain also in details. Okay, and now selected limitations. I think they could apply, but I said in none, uh, in not, not in 100% for makers. The first, private and non-commercial use. Private use is a use uh, understood very narrowly. It's a use only at home or within an individual uh, sport activity and for non-commercial purposes. And these two requirements, uh, requirements are not separated. So you cannot claim that I did it at home but I, uh, I sold it or the other way around. They, have to, they go always together. Um, so, for instance, uh, churches, hospitals, schools, cannot invoke on this uh, on these exceptions because they wo they work in the public sphere and uh, likewise likewise uh, freelancers who work at home if they use a certain uh, patented device um, in pursuing their prof profession they cannot also claim this exception the idea underlying this exception um, is is very simple Patent rights are uh, tools of public, uh, com of pub well, working in the public sphere and serving the commercial purposes. And that's why they cannot intrude and regulate the private sphere. That's the first one. The second one, individuals are free from the due diligence on patents if they want to use a patented device at home. In the context of making, I think it applies only as far as you stay really in the in the close price with sphere and you don't share the idea uh, in, the, in the public sphere. Then the experimental use, I would say this is, uh, this is a tool that would be the most useful in case of making. Experimental use covers tests, experiments, and now I have to underline on patented uh, substance, on patented device, to gain additional information, additional knowledge, this exception serves, uh, well, uh, serves further development of patented, uh, patented devices and substances and serves the research and teaching purposes. Mm. As said, experiments are allowed as long as they are on patented device, so we cannot apply software, I don't know, any device to, to measure, to test other, uh, other patented uh, devices. And as long as you intend to, to gain new, new information, for instance, new indications, new characteristics, new features of a patented device, you can invoke on these exceptions. But if you intend to measure, uh, measure, for instance, marketing opportunities, price, demand, or production uh, conditions, you can, you, this, this exception will not help you. Um, in the European doctrines, the commercial motivation behind, um, behind tests is acceptable, but as long as tests really uh, provide additional and they extend the understanding of patented device or substance. Uh, the, um, the US doctrine is very strict. The understanding um, stems for, from um, case law from like 200 uh, years old. And it says that experiments done for idle curiosity, satisfaction, and amusement are only exem uh, exempted. Um, recently, well, recently it's like about, about 30 years ago, uh, but uh, the US doctrine introduced also the term of legitimate interest and legitimate objective, which refers to professional ob uh, objectives that are also reached during the experiments. And if the court finds that there is some business uh, objective behind test, this, this exception will not help you. Mm. But I said, I think it's the most applicable exceptions in the context of making, as long as you really test patented substances um, and devices. Then there is prior use, right? I find it also a good uh, tool for makers. And prior use, right? Uh -huh. Prior use right concerns uses that occurred before filing patent application. So it means if makers were before patent holders with uh, his or her patent application. Um, 
um, to prove or to invoke and to, or to claim patent use right, you have to provide flawless and outstanding evidence of developments and attempts to put the, the idea you are working on on the market. And the court would consider, well, many things. One of, two of them are the similarity between two, two technologies, so the one, the patented one and the yours. And then also we will consider how the technology were obtained. And um, well, it, the court will, will, will um, test whether this technology was not stolen. And I think this prior use right is a really good tool if you have a situation that you discovered invented something before patent application. Then the exhaustion principle, it's not a codified so far, it's a legal doctrine but because it was in the catalog of the UPC agreement, I left it here. Uh, the, uh, the exhaustion doctrine is a crucial element of every legal system. Um, it says that patent rights exhaust when a prod once a product was put on the market with the permission of the patent holder. The repair doctrine is the extension of this, and it allows you to restore the normal utility of a patented device However, it's, uh, this, although the definition is very simple, its application is extremely complicated because every time the court faced such an issue, uh, the court has to answer the following question, how much is allowed and how much was too much? And uh, the case law is very rich in this subject matter. Um, I extracted some, some rules, general rules, of allowed and um, forbidden in, uh, repair. So if you, have patented, if you have a patented combination and you restore uh, one worn out element but the, whole but the only combination is patented, then this is allowed. I see your tired faces, but this is legal stuff and I know it's not easy. Mm. And then if one piece is patented or each element of device is under patent protection if you, and if you replace replace it, then this is considered as forbidden reconstruction. And in the US doctrine, there's also a situation called akin to repair, when a patented device gain additional a new function. But this is only this is allowed only if you change non patented elements. Um, the European doctrines have also very complex analysis. They consider the following uh, elements like the essentiality of the element, its contribution to technical teaching, um, mm, uh, how it influenced the ident identity of patented device, of patented invention, and then the trade-off. So the in they consider the interest of the patent holder and the society. And I said, um, I think in the context of making, uh, the repair doctrine does not allow too much because I think uh, makers are so advanced in their improvement and developing uh, process that they exceed very often this, this narrow scope of repair doctrine. Then, um, now I'm with legal doctrines. Uh, these three consider the equivalency, um, and before I shortly describe the three of them, I would like to talk about the scope of every patent, um, because this is very crucial in understanding what is equivalent to a patent. So every patent consists of some parts. There is description, drawings, and the most important, patent claims. And when you read patent claims, literally, it's the core of every patented invention. But the description can slightly stretch the protection around the patent claims. And a person skilled in the art, that's the term in the, in the legal, um, in the, this field, so an expert patent examiners can also stretch a bit more on the equivalence, so similar issues, similar things between patented device and, uh, and, and, and others. And these three, uh, these three doctrines consider this, uh, concern the situation of equivalency. The Formstein, three of them, they based on case law. The Formstein uh, you can find in the German, uh, in the German case law, and it allows, or it really, um, 
it's also complicated for me. So if you have an equivalent element, it may be not infringing if the court finds that it's non-patentable in the light of the prior art. The prior art, it's everything that was published, disclosed publicly before the patent application. So if the court see, and this is based on the um, report given by the person, so-called person skilled in the art, so experts, so if the court see that an element can, uh, is based on the prior art and doesn't reach uh, the inventive, the, the necessary inventiveness, in the level of inventiveness, uh, this, this, this element might be considered as non-infringing. The Gillette is found uh, in the UK uh, case law. It covers similar situation. So when an element is non-infringing in the light of prior art, um, the case was very interesting. It's not a recent. It's uh, from the beginning of the 20th century. And the Gillette patented uh, safety razors, and the competitors presented uh, similar ones. And the Gillette claimed that these scissors, you can imagine old rectangular ones sh shaped, and Gillette claimed that they infringed, uh, infringed the, the safety razors. The, the defendant said that they were not novel because you, can, you could easily derive and find them in the prior art. And the Gillette defense had two consequences. If the element uh, constitutes a part of patented uh, invention, um, and then the defendant managed to prove that this element belongs to prior art, we have two consequences. The patent is invalid, and there is non-infringement. Uh, non and then if the patent, if this element is outside the protected invention, then uh, we have two positive, actually, situations, because there is non-infringement, and, and then the patent stays valid. The reverse doctrine of equivalence is in the US law, and has also similar character. An element, if it's found non-equivalent, but um, then, it's, then also it's deemed as non-infringing. But here, an element is equivalent when it reached the same functions, but in completely different way. So coming back to what I said about patents, it's extremely important to understand the real scope of the patent protection in a given case and to understand what are equivalents. And not, uh, well, the reverse doctrine of equivalents is nice theory, theory, but so far I haven't found any case that would prove the non-infringement based on this theory. Three of them are extremely uh, challenging in, uh, to prove in the court prosecution um, because every time you have a patent infringement claim, the plaintiff does a lot of work to prove that your invention does infringe the patented one. You have a claim, uh, um, claim charge when you have shown the similarities between two, two objects, and then it's your work to prove that either you are outside the patent in a patent scope or simply that you are, you, well, you don't infringe. And then take home message, um, unfortunately, the scopes of available patent limitations are very narrow, and I said I don't think they, they apply 100% to an adopted model of making, and you have to, I hope now you are more aware of their scope of, and their usefulness. Um, then I heard a lot, uh, many times, that in patent holders, they go after, you know, the, the ones who make really a lot of money with patents. Well. It might be the case, but I would be um, more uh, skeptical about this because if they want to prove or they want to enforce their patents only to show that they are the patent holders, they will, can go after everyone. So if, you, if you're making in the private sphere and you don't make money, you don't make a good, a great business um, in, this, uh, in this field, then you make feel a bit uh, safer, but I don't give you 100% uh, percent of guarantee. Of course, when you start commercialization, then you have to be really aware and really careful in, in your undertakings. Um, 
And then be please aware if you make on patented device, and here I don't mean a single patented uh, object, but there are objects that contain really a lot of, of patented small elements, then please be aware of them. There is an institution of marking. Some objects have named patented patents embedded in these objects. So please be careful and read, because unfortunately so far I don't see any um, any tool that would protect makers in 100%. That's all. Thank you. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Natalia, um, I've seen uh, some intents from companies uh, in order to patent uh, DNA patterns, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, uh, do you think that could happen in the future as well? Because you mentioned the biological stuff, technology. Yeah, it's patentable, that's true. Well, as, as long as it's um, achieved in in vitro way, so it's not taken from the human beings, you know, but it's the la in laboratory conditions, yeah, it might be patented. There are proteins that are patented. Mm. I know. <laughs> I agree. Well. Yeah. And there is. Ah, very good. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so when you are you, let's say that you do a, um, a private uh, experiment or a private uh, use of a patented device, and uh, then you communicate uh, your findings or how to to another person do it. Uh, um, how are you exposing yourself to uh, uh, liability? Well, it's simply by the fact that you, um, you open this private sphere and you start sharing the idea. Well, I understand, for instance, an improved patented idea publicly, mm -hmm. because even a neighborhood aid is very critical, simply because you, really, you leave the narrow scope of privacy. It's, it's very narrow. So as I said, well, many makers do something in garage, in a basement, and this is understood as a private sphere, only this. Okay, but uh, mm. let, doesn't the, the patent description cover uh, covers it? So I, I would be working inside the, the, the patent description if, if I describe um, <clears throat> part of the, uh, I'm, I'm not doing, um, uh, how do you say, um, um, a, new, a new use of the, mm -hmm. the, the, the device. But you mean like you simply d you want to re you you just if read the patent reverse and yes. reverse by reverse engineering, yeah? Yes. Well, yeah, that's that's okay. But I said as long as you use it in private sphere, if you go to a friend and then I don't know, you start using it in a public sphere because I don't know, it's a bi let's say improved bike, just to give a simple um, example, then you use it in a public sphere. So you expose yourself. That's the point. That's the point. Mm. Mm? Okay. I hope I answer. Well, we can talk about it later. Hmm? Yeah, we got um, maybe one minute for uh, another question. Well, I guess that's it then for this talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, <laughs> not a rosy picture, but important to know. <laughs> Thank you.